Welcome to uh, this last seminar. It's my pleasure to either introduce you or reintroduce you to uh, one of our own, Mrs. Uh, Claire Campbell-Larry. She joined us in February of last year. Um, she's a postdoc in my group, and she's going to present some of her research uh, that she's been working on since she's gotten here. Um, Sarah is uh, both from the island of Malta, which she'll show you where that is if you don't know where that is. Um, so that means she's Maltese, which is kind of a cool thing to be able to say. Um, she also went to the University of Malta where she uh, majored in math with an S and physics. Uh, so she's from one of those places that spells math weird. <laughs> uh, and she also got her master's in physics at the University of Malta. Then she did her PhD at the University of Edinburgh, uh, which is in a very different island, a little bit further north. And she'll give us all of her backstory, but today she's going to talk mostly about uh, the electrification of heavy duty vehicles. Um, and with that, take it away, Sue. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so, thank you then for giving me the opportunity to speak today to you all and thank you for coming. Um, so, as Zen said, predominantly I'll be speaking about the impact of heavy duty vehicles which is a project I've been working on for the last months. And um, there are numerous collaborators on this project. And these collaborators have been working on the project way before I came here. So these people deserve a lot of acknowledgements. And um, we have people from here, so you can see familiar faces on there um, from this department. And then we have people from the Institute of Sustainable Energy and other collaborators that have provided um, substantial and very good feedback for our, for our project here. And also there are some funders. But before I get into that, I decided to give you like a journey through how I got here. Um, so where do I come from? I come from a very small island, which I had to explain multiple times <laughs> that I've arrived here, where that is. Um, so it's in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's about 122 square miles super small, everyone knows everyone. Um, pretty scary dating in the island. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, these are some shots I took this summer. Clear blue skies, um, clear waters. I'm a beach girl, I love the beach. Um, but that's very a very biased um, image of our island. You wouldn't see that everywhere you go. Um, so I appreciate the scenery I get to see here. I got my BSc um, in math and physics. I got an MSc, and that's the first time I started working with weather models. And um, my first introduction to the modeling world was using the work, the uh, weather research and forecasting model. And there, I used that model to simulate like um, wind patterns over our island. Being an island, um, it was very hard for models to capture such a small, tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean with so many dynamics happening. So it was really hard to get the model working well, which we didn't fail to do, but it was still hard and still not working properly. Um, okay, then I moved to the UK. I moved to Edinburgh. Edinburgh is a beautiful city. We get to go there just to visit. It's beautiful. At the time, I thought there was maybe two snowstorms. It was the first time I knew about snow. I, I experienced snow. We don't get snow back home. And I thought I knew all about what a um, harsh winter was about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got my PhD in environmental science. And then I started to work with not only weather models, but chemistry climate models. So then adding the component of chemistry into the model, which adds complexity but gives you much better results right because it's a better presentation of the real world um i use different model resolutions ranging from global scales to um, more high resolution data about 12 kilometers and i also um dug into a bit the uh, the interactions between air quality and health which is what um drove me to move to the uk for the first time and study abroad um for this interdisciplinary aspect of, of this kind of work. Um, I was at the University of Edinburgh. I worked with Public Health England, who were my funding body, and with the Met Office, and these models were predominantly um, derived by the Met Office. So what's our pollution? That's something that, that's a picture from Los Angeles. That's how air pollution could look like. And that's how, in the absence of air pollution, what, what a day could look like. Um, this 
image here is from um, Los Angeles in April 14, 2020. That was during a lockdown period. However, it's not ex exactly clear if the main driver driving force was the lockdown or if it was a storm that happened before that cleared away um, the, the, the atmosphere. But nonetheless, there's no pollution in the second picture. But sometimes we don't necessarily see a pollution, right? But we can have, um, there are so many adverse health effects associated with our pollution. In particular, this is the latest um, report from the Health Effects Institute, looking at particularly um, traffic-related air pollution. And there's all sorts of high confidence in the negative relationships between um, the exposure to air pollutants. And here they're looking at PM2.5, NO2, and elemental carbon. And they're finding um, high confidence in, in all cause mortality rates and circulatory mortality, but also morbidity effects related to like asthma, for example. So we've got emissions, right? Emitting into the atmosphere, particles, gases, emissions, particle chemistry happening, dispersion. And then we have either the production of primary pollutants and like particulate matter and NOx, which I'll be talking a lot about, or a second pollutant such as ozone, which has a lot of adverse health effects as well. And then that creates all sorts of um, adverse health effects, which is why we want to study this. So going, I'm going to skim through some of the studies I've done throughout my PhD and my previous postdoc, and then I'll get into the um, heavy duty vehicles. The first, um, my thesis was basically three research chapters, right? It's the UK method. This was my first chapter. I looked at the impact of resolution. And this was pretty cool to look at um, a global resolution, like 150 versus a 50 kilometer. And what we found that was there, there was um, a lot of differences. This is like changes in PM 2.5 for spring. And that's showing that the global model had much lower PM 2.5 concentrations in spring. And we could, we looked at a lot of parameters, but this is rainfall rate. And we could see um, in the global model actually saw higher precipitation, like higher rainfall rates. So that could have contributed to that production in your PM 2.5. But what was very interesting is that that was not consistent throughout the season. So we saw a seasonality in those differences. Um, and this is very important because if you do a health impact assessment using these concentrations, um, then that could um, impact your results. And we find that, that that impact was about 5% difference, plus or minus 5%, which is substantial when you're talking about health effects, right? My second chapter was about air pollution episodes. And um, we decided to choose episodes where we had high um, air pollution events with high PM 2.5 and ozone that typically don't occur at the same time. And we tried to first identify the driving forces. Yeah. I'm so sorry, what is PM? Okay, good question. PM is particulate matter. So partic particles in the atmosphere of different sizes here I'm talking about sizes of 2.5 micrometer. So they're very uh, bad for our health because they're inhaled and get through our lung system and then they cause irritation and all sorts of health effects. Okay, Good. thank you for asking that. Um, so ozone then is another pollutant that's produced through chemical reactions. Um, and we saw that uh, the driving forces here were anticyclonic conditions and easterly winds that were that were um, very low in wind speed. And this caused our local emissions to remain within the area. There was high increased temperature as well. And it could also could have been related to um, driving air pollution from slow uh, movement from continental Europe. And this had an impact of about 38% excess deaths. And why this is important is that this is happening over a short period of time, like five days. And this has implications for like um, hospitals, et cetera, which would, um, if we have a model that's able to predict such events, then we could advise um, health authorities that such an event would happen. And this was a very big episode in the UK, which caused all sorts of issues in the health department. And the last part of my PhD was related to future health burdens. So we look at future emission projections and future population projections. We saw that in the future, following these RCB scenarios, which are used in the IPCC reports, 
And we saw reductions in that PM2.5 concentration. But then when we incorporated changes in the population, um, our attributable mortality, so when we estimate the health impacts, um, was positive. And that's because even though we have a reduction in our air pollution, we have more people exposed to it because the population projection was showing an increase in your population. So then I went back home after I spent three years, nine months, and a couple of days doing my PhD. And I moved back home and I started a postdoc. And from the um, modeling world, I moved into the measurement world. And this was a really nice opportunity for me because I always assumed measurements were the be all and end all to which I always compared my models. And I wanted my models to behave as close to those measurements as possible. But I figured out that measurements have their own faults, don't they? Um, so yeah, I had the I had to calibrate all those instrumentations. Um, there you can see the whole suite of um, instrumentations that we had. They measured all sorts of pollutants. And what was pretty cool is was it was that I was in charge of this van as well. I did not drive it. I did not have a license to drive that. <laughs> um, but I had to set it up. And um, so we had two sets of instrumentations. One we could have indoors and one we could have outdoors. So we could see the if, if there were any infiltration systems, what's the difference between the outdoor and indoor environment. And um, that's me on the van there. Um, and then we also had some laboratory work where we collected um, samples where we had first we conditioned samples and then we collected data on them, like gravimetric data for these PM, these particles in the atmosphere. And you can see the filter turns from white turns to black or whatever. That means it has actually collected the air pollution that we have. Um, so some work I've done amongst most, um, I've tried to, um, try to, when we look at air pollution exposure, we typically have a population and we assume it's static, right? We, the population data is typically where people live. What we try to do with this work is we try to estimate the movement of people through, um, time activity, like a generic time activity profile for weekend and weekdays. So we assumed people moving in different microenvironments. The microenvironment can be the work or, or your home or outdoors, et cetera. So we try to estimate the movement of people and then allocate their exposure based on that. So that was a food study. Another food study was um, getting indoor concentrations um, of PM in this case. Um, oh, why is this happening? Okay, there we go. Um, while doing daily household activities like cooking, burning toast, um, sweeping, switching on candles. Um, and we did figure out that, um, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's known, but we, we quantified that. And we found um, that sweeping caused the highest PM concentrations, basically has um, PM 2.5 falls down on, on the ground. And then even like by moving on carpets or sweeping that you have resuspension of these particles in the air and you have large concentrations. And this has application for people who have asthma. This is a horrible, this was called, this was, would cause an asthma uh, attack. Um, we also found that black carbon was mostly related to combustion. So burning of paraffin wax candles, et cetera. And the, the um, this would be worse, of course, if you have a closed system. So the closer, the, clo the more closed your rooms were, the worse this, this would be. Whereas if you have an open system or if you open the windows, then that would be diluted much, much, much um, quicker. And the last piece of work is related to what I'll be talking to you um, soon about is related to um, the COVID impacts um, and how that affected our air pollution um, back home. Um, the results I'm showing here um, are results from our traffic site. And this project, um, basically the background, Malta has a very high um, vehicle per capita. It's also um, signed up to a lot of EU um, targets for, um, internal, for cutting off internal combustion engines. So we thought this was a great um, like real life experiment to try and test what implications that would have on our local environment. And, but what we wanted to do is like, there's a lot of studies about this um, out um, to, during that period, but what we wanted to do is to isolate the weather effect from the COVID effect, right? So what we, do, what we did is we use the random forest machine learning algorithm where we took um, the data from 20, 2008 to 2017, and we trained the model on that. 
We train the model on weather data and air pollution data, and then we use that algorithm to predict the um, concentration during the COVID period based on the weather data to try and isolate those two um, from each other. So here you can see that initially the green, which is the predicted, and the black, which is the observed, are close to each other. That's what the model is predicting. And then here is when the school shut down in 2020. That was my birthday, horrible birthday. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, this was the lockdown period. And you can see that our random forest is predicting that there should have been higher NO2 concentration. But because of the lockdown, there was lower concentration. And that difference between those two lines is, could be actually allocated to the COVID effect, right? So that was um, quite a neat piece of work to like isolate the, the impact um, to a machine learning algorithm. And if you want to look at numbers, we quantify that to be about 50, a uh, decrease of about 54%. Then I came to Edinburgh and I figured out that's how I looked for the first six months since I came here, like from January to May. This is me. Um, so yeah, I moved back to the modeling world and today I'll be presenting to you um, what you all came to hear about the heavy duty vehicles. So this project, um, I'll be talking about the impacts of heavy duty vehicles and if we had to shift those to electric and their impacts of, um, on emissions, on the air quality, on health and some environmental justice work. And that's the truck. <laughs> so why do we care about heavy duty vehicles? So heavy duty vehicles only represent about 6% of on-road vehicles, right? So it's a small portion. And when I talk about heavy duty vehicles, we're referring to like um, intercity transit, school buses, motorhomes, and we have the short haul and long haul trucks. We're referring to that class is two to eight. Um, heavy duty vehicles are large emitters of CO2. So shifting to electric heavy duty vehicles is uh, commonly sought after climate mitigation policy. It's also, however, heavy duty vehicles do not only impact CO2, but are large contributors to NOx, which is um, horrible for health. Um, also, NOx is related to ozone. When it's emitted in the atmosphere, it reacts to produce ozone. Um, and then it's a significant source of PM, particulate matter. Um, it has also a lot of health implications. So 43% of traffic-related PM2.5 and ozone um, are actually attributable to um, diesel pollution. And NO2 is associated with pediatric asthma, around 200,000, that's the latest estimate. And also because of where the emissions of heavy duty vehicles occur, they do not impact everyone the same, but um, the emissions disproportionately impact racial minorities. So this has large implications. What we don't know about heavy duty vehicles, well, we know they, um, they can have an impact, a great impact on, on climate and reduce CO2, but what we don't know is their impact very well, is their impact on air quality and health, particularly, particularly at high resolutions of that one kilometer. And that's important because we don't only want to know what's happening and by how much they're decreasing, but where those decreases are happening, right? Um, some, Stats about EVs in 2021, we were about 4%, and 4% of sales were EVs. In the first six months of this year, it's about 7%. And we have targets of about 50% EV sales by 2030. So we have a long way to go. Um, if you want to stay with a, in, within the limit of a two degrees Celsius, then we have to target about 46% zero emission US um, heavy duty vehicles should be um, zero emitting for 2030. Okay. Um, so this is this estimate of 46% really solely heavy duty vehicles. So what is our simulation about and how we how do we try to approximate um, this shift from internal combustion engines to electric? So what we do is we electrify 30% of heavy duty vehicles. And we do that by scaling down the vehicle miles traveled of each car. And then we also reduce um, the tailpipe emissions, refueling emissions and other emissions like extended isolated emissions by 30%. And 30% falls within that range of all the estimates and projections that are out there at the moment. And 
But what we also want to know is we don't want to just know the, the reductions in emissions of the tailpipe, but we also want to know that additional electricity increase and what implications would that have in terms of emissions at power stations, right? Um, so we use here in this work, we do not account for any shifts in the electric grid infrastructure. So we're using the 2016 grid as is. So this is quite a conservative estimate because we know as time goes by, we have a decarbonizing grid whereby we are shifting to renewables. Um, so this is a conservative estimate. Um, we estimate where we're getting our energy from. Um, by a set of uh, weights. Um, so in this novel emission remapping work algorithm, we first estimate that additional electricity needed to charge our electric vehicles. And then we estimate where we're getting that from. In the US, this is how the grid works. Um, depending on where the country is, it can only get the electricity from the region within which it lies, okay? so the county is within there, it gets its energy from those EGUs. It can't get energy from all over. So um, we also um, put a weight of distance. So depending on where the EGU is, the closer you are to the EGU, the more probable it is that you'll get that energy from there. Depending on the age, the younger the EGU, the more preferable it is to supply the energy. And depending on the capacity, the net capacity of the EGU. And then we put all that into our CTM, run at 1.3 kilometer resolution. Um, we have a WARF move smoke modeling framework where WARF is the weather component. Then we use that to drive our meteorologically informed um, emissions. And then we use those emissions. Uh, within those emissions, we have um, domain specific surrogates where we know where those emissions are happening at a very high resolution. And then we have the CMAP model, which has all these interactions into it. So like radiation and physics schemes and chemistry schemes, et cetera. And this is two-way coupled. So the weather can impact our pollutant concentrations and our pollutant concentrations can impact um, our weather conditions. And we're going to focus on three main pollutants, NO2, oxygen dioxide, MDAH ozone, that's the daily maximum eight hour running mean ozone, and it's a metric used in health impact assessment. And so that's why we'll look at that in particular. And there's PM2.5. We run four simulations in total. Just to give you an idea, um, a run of one month takes about 12 to 15 days to run in real time. So we run one month, um, one in August and one in October 2018, and then we run one in January and April 2019 to try and simulate the seasons, right? Um, we run a baseline whereby most of the heavy duty vehicles are diesel, and then we run the electric heavy duty vehicle scenario with this 30% reduction. And then we look at differences, which are the HDB minus the baseline. But this is one of the main results. So here we have reductions in NOx emissions. So you can see the resolution of our model able to capture the major road networks, the high intensity in like, cities like downtown Chicago and Cook County, etc. So here we have overall on-road NOx reductions as one would expect with removing the emissions from on-road, but there are also isolated increases, which are very small. It's where the EGUs lie. And these are where the power plants lie within our domain. And within those small points, we do see increases, but overall we see reductions in our NOx concentration. And these are, so here, this is within our domain, we're predominantly running on gas, but we do have some coal EGUs, right? What does this mean in terms of net emissions? We have net emission, we actually simulate net emission reductions for NOx, Although we have increases at those um, points, at those EGUs, um, but overall we have um, net emission reductions of about 7%. SO2 is the only emission that um, we see increases, and that's related to the coal EGUs, which SO2 predom predominantly comes from their sulfur dioxide. We also see net CO2 emission reductions as we have previously anticipated. We see about 2.7 million tons per year produced and that translates to about 503 million per year saved within our domain. 
and that's using a social cost of carbon of 180 times. Um, what does that imply in terms of air quality changes? So A is changes in NO2, and B is changes in PM2.5. So we see overall um, reductions in those two pollutants, and this predominantly reflects those changes in NOx emissions that we saw before. However, for ozone, ozone is a very particular pollutant since it's produced from other things. And it is very temperamental and because it depends on the chemistry of the atmosphere. So we actually simulate isolated increases in our urban hubs um, following the EHDB adoption, which is super interesting, right? For me, it's super interesting. <laughs> so uh, here I'm going to try and explain why that is happening. Um, so NO2 is related to ozone. And this is the chemistry very simplified um, diagram of the chemistry that happens. And ozone can be produced through photolysis in the atmosphere, but it can be depleted by um, reactions with NO. And there are, there's a relationship between um, NO and VOC. So if we look at the VOC to NOx ratio, that can help us determine what's happening in these diagrams here. I'm sorry, so, yeah. What's yeah? VOC? Okay, thank you. VOC is volatile organic compounds, and it has an, um, it, it is one of the drivers in ozone production. Okay, so it's a volatile organic compound. Um, so that is the transition line here, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Anything that's within this line, so anything that has a ratio, um, a VOC to NOx ratio that's high is considered um, a clean environment, okay? Whereas anything that has a VOC to NOx ratio that's low, meaning there's more NOx, there's more pollutants, um, is considered a dirty or a polluted environment. And this is what we simulate in our model. We simulate low VOC to NOx ratio, so a dirty environment, polluted environment in our urban regions, and when we have in those regions in the purple area, the relationship between NOx and ozone is nonlinear. Once you reduce one, the other one increases. Um, when you are in this area, in a clean environment, in an urban environment, they have a linear relationship. If you reduce one, you reduce the other, okay? So what's happening is you have different chemical regimes here and the interaction um, between the NOx and ozone there are linear relationships and non-linear relationships, which creates a lot of complex, um, complex interpretation of these results, right? Um, we predict that um, at the moment we're somewhere here, right? If we had to reduce further our NOx, even more than 30%, we could start shifting to a cleaner environment whereby the relationship would be linear. And reducing this would result in an overall reduction in this. Okay, so I'm hopeful that there's that heavy duty vehicles can even reduce um, ozone across our domain. We also looked at the exceedances, which means the number of days where your ozone levels are higher um, than a certain level. In this particular case, we're looking at 50 ppb, and we see actually an addition, an additional number of days where our ozone levels were higher than that level. Moving on to the health calculations. Um, so in this work, we looked at health calculations following this method here, where we first estimate the fraction of the baseline mortality that we can actually attribute to um, the change in concentration that we have. And we do that by using um, a concentration response coefficient that comes from epidemiological studies where they look at a large cohort of people, they follow them up and they look at the concentrations and the effects of people and they come up with this relationship a concentration response co um, coefficient that we then plug into these equations. Um, X is the pollutant concentrations and now we're looking at the census tract level. And then once we have that fraction that we know, we multiply that by the baseline mortality rate, how many people are dying, but we know the fraction that we can attribute to our pollutant concentration and the population. So what does 
that result in, we see overall reductions in the attributable mortality. So the mortality we can attribute to that um, pollutant. And we see reductions in the PM2.5 attributable mortality. In terms of numbers, we're talking about 580 um, people annually and 65 people annual avoided premature deaths related to these two pollutants. But we also see increases because of that ozone increase, right? Of about 54 additional beds following this EHDB adoption scenario. What important to highlight as well is that um, our differences in deaths, in attributable deaths, um, are a bit different from our spatial distribution of changes in NO2. And this comes from the fact, so you can see here some sample strikes that have higher attributable mortality that's not particularly pronounced here. And that comes from the fact that in the equation, we do not have the, only the effect of the concentration, but we also have the effect of two other data sets, which are the baseline mortality and the population, okay? So you can see here that there are some census tracts that have a high baseline mortality rate, meaning more people in those census tracts died. Um, so because, all of those are incorporated in your estimation, then this has an influence as well, okay? Moving on to the last part of this talk, um, I'll be talking now about um, air pollution and health disparities. And there are multiple ways of how you can address this. We visit um, one small calculation here, which we're trying to um, improve and add more onto that. So what we did is we got our population and we got the census tracts um, and looked at the white population and took the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile. And anything below the 10th percentile, we um, defined as least white and anything above uh, the 90th percentile, we defined as most white, okay? And then we picked those census tracts and we looked at the changes in air pollution concentrations within those census tracts to try and see if there's a difference. So with that definition of least white, so anything below the 10th percentile of white population, if we look here, if we look at the blue bars, so that's the zero line here, and here you have changes in concentration, so reductions here in NO2, for example, and you can see that in the blue, the least white census tract, um, we see the largest decreases in our NO2 and the largest decreases in PM2.5, um, which are much larger than the, the most white um, census tract. And if we look at the attributable mortality, which are now the dashed blue lines, we can see that in least white communities, um, we see larger health benefits. You can see here reductions of 10% versus a reduction of about 5%. So we're seeing that in census tracts that we define as least whites, we have a um, larger health impact. Um, larger health benefits. So in conclusion, um, I hope I convinced you that shifting 30% of heavy duty vehicles, even though if we had to just leave our electric grid as is with no changes, then we see net emission reductions. We see also reductions in PM25 and NO2, even though we see some increases in ozone. Overall public health benefits, and we see those reductions in environmental disparities and health, better health impacts, better health benefits in um, marginalized communities. Some of our future work. So um, what we're trying to do now is um, we're going to update our emissions model. Um, right now, our interpretation of idling emissions is a bit limited and there has been some updates on that. Um, which we're trying to incorporate in our model to better, better represent these emissions, which are highly important for heavy duty vehicles in particular. Um, I mean, what I mean by idling emissions is emissions by trucks at warehouses, et cetera, while they're loading and unloading things. Um, we're looking further into environmental justice implications of this work using different metrics and using different indices, et cetera. And I'm also interested in, in the long run to look at other um, climate driven impacts and seeing their impacts on air quality. For example, I'm interested in like, looking at heat pumps during heat waves, the additional um, usage of heat pumps, what does that mean in terms of our air quality, et cetera, and the health implications. 
So with that, these are some references and thank you and I'll take any questions. So are the health benefits for uh, racial minority or marginalized groups, are those greater health benefits because there are more EGUs in those areas? No, there are. So the most of our health benefits and reductions in ozone concentrations are actually driven by the, the on-road changes and not by the changes in the EGUs. Within the census tract that we define as least whites, we see the largest um, health benefits. So we see like reductions in, in the annual avoided deaths. Yeah, I think that's like because of where they're located, like closer to Rome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's because they're um, um, because those communities are predominantly and live closer to the highways and highways, yeah. etc., and in urban areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To what extent has anyone tried to distinguish the health effects of different chemical categories of particulate matter? I mean, I imagine that the particles derived from wearing a brake pads would be biologically active in a different way than those produced by the combustion of fuel. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very like current area of research. Um, there's we don't know much. We don't we don't know much about the speciation of PM2.5 and its individual components and what effects it has. We know that um towers and vaporous have more metals in them. So most probably they have more um, health effects as compared to if you look at the general PM2.5. There's also health implications, toxic health implications for um, black carbon, which we also don't mention here. But there are very limited studies on looking at that beta value that I mentioned that we use in our equations. So far, we don't have any beta values that comes from large studies and meta-analysis. Um, to give us a, a, a clear indication of that relationship. We know that might be there, but we don't, it hasn't been quantified as yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the, the technology behind electric heavy duty vehicles and what actually exists versus what has to be developed. And, you know, I can imagine your average trucker is not enthusiastic about this change. Um, and so, where, where that lies. Yeah, absolutely. So although here we don't look at a life cycle analysis, right? We're not looking at what implications there are for the manufacturing of the cars, et cetera. But yeah, although we're not there yet, um, there's a large drive to policy and initiatives um, to um, move forward and to um, improve technologies for like, for example, um, hooking onto the, the brake core emissions. We know that in the future, having electric heavy duty vehicles, those are very um, heavy, which might result in an increase in those type of emissions, which I don't talk about here. Here I talk about tailpipe exhaust emissions. Those non-exhaust emissions might increase in the future. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of research going on on how to make them lighter and how to actually try and, um, and yeah, improve that. There's also a lot, a lot of research I'm reading this morning in Science Journal about um, the recycling of the batteries eventually, which, yeah, that would be another additional um, aspect of this, which, which I did not talk about. But um, there are um, major um, companies that are endorsing heavy duty vehicles becoming electric. There are heavy duty vehicle, um, vehicles, ele electric heavy duty vehicles on the market. And so there are possibilities and, and there is um, technology and technology is advancing and, and, and increasing at a large rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for a great talk. This is so interesting. <laughs> and uh, in terms of cost, I really like your superposition of kind of geography where people live and uh, mm -hmm. sort of impacts on these emissions. In the meantime, like while this transition will hopefully happen towards electric vehicles, is there any way we could reroute them, you know, just so that they, it may add their travel distance and maybe that's also worse because they travel longer, but in that sense to make them further away from these communities that are burning a bit. Yeah, there are a lot of studies about um, traffic models where they try and simulate 
um, if, if we disperse them on, if we disperse the pollution and not let it come through through the, the one main road or through the one main highway. Yeah, that has, um, I think it could be done. I think um, it's harder to convince people to take a longer route just to reduce the emissions, whereas they know there's a direct route that can take them somewhere. I think convincing people to do that is, is, is quite hard. Um, but yeah, that is uh, there are possibilities like that, and there are people who actually simulate the particularly in Chicago. There's a study that tries to simulate um, if people got out at different times of the day and the people use different routes, um, how we could like avoid having those rush hour peaks and avoid having that congestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a, a decade ago, I read a study where it's more from um, during the West Virginia Congress was working on PM 2.5 and heart disease and things like that. And, and it's like, what was more like, so I mean, kind of granular enough, or is, is it a good idea to like go for a run along Lakeshore Drive? You know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, is, is, is it get down to the point of like policy about how you like develop greenways and, and you know, these people are around? Like, you know, can you differentiate like a better run? In the park is it you know cost benefits is it good to have exercise but it's bad that you know basically yeah. cost on a tailpipe like, yeah absolutely yeah. i mean if you had two options you'd be much better off exercising in a clean environment rather than exercising in, in a non-clean environment but there's been a study that has looked at the overall like cycle of things and actually exercising super feeds the negative health okay. effects of exercising in, in a polluted in a environment so Exercise wherever you get the chance to. <laughs> um, yeah, but of course, if, if you, it depends because it always depends how long you're going to stay in that. Like people also argue, like in traffic, are you exposed to such high concentrations? It depends how long you stay in that traffic. If you stay in a for a long period of time in a lower concentration, it could be as bad as standing for a small period of time in a very high concentration. So it also depends on the time that you're spending in that environment. Yeah, I thought the first question is really interesting too. We've often wondered about the composition of the material. You know, so there, is it, uh, maybe you already answered this, but he was saying brake pads. I was thinking, you know, concrete particles, dust, but like, like, what did that matter? Has it, has it, has it, is it because it's, people can't collect enough to measure, like, or, or what, what's the competing, you know, characterization of this material? Particulate matter includes all sorts of things in it. it includes metals and includes organic um, components and includes inorganic um, components to it. It's just a collaboration of, of things together and joining up together and it's defined by size. Um, but yeah, parts of it um, are more toxic than others and then yeah, part well, of it. Is it is electrified vehicles. Yeah, you're sitting there, I know you showed a plot, but I, I didn't get like so that. Made the problem worse or better with electrification and the particulate matter. Yeah. Yeah. So because we're looking at um exhaust, um, yeah, we see overall reductions in RPM two point five. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So that's that's RPM two point five. Now in this case, we're not taking into account um the non-exhaust emissions. So we're not taking into account changes in in brake wear and tire wear. Basically, because uh, we assume well, electric vehicles are still going to go on the road, they're still going to have brake wear and tire wear. So here we just have the exhaust component of, of things. Yeah. Great, thank you. Come on. I'll do one. Oh, no, you go. <laughs> um, how did you settle on simulating a 30% reduction in heavy vehicle? Yeah. I think 30% is an in-between, is a happy in-between between all those estimates um, of 50%. And like within all the estimates so far are sort of targeting at having about a 50% electric vehicle, 50% electric vehicle sales by about 2030. So we think like 30% for an instantaneous change now is like within that range. So that's how, yeah, there's isn't much like science behind that. But. We think it's a possible scenario. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, well, why are there so many cars in Malta? Oh, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. It's very densely populated, so there's a lot of okay. people. But yeah, I think the mentality of people is just <laughs> everyone, once they turn 18, they go buy a car. And yeah, families have one car per person, some have three per person. And 
yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's a cultural thing and it's a lot of hard. Yeah, I am guilty of using my car for a 10 minute walk when I go back and I walk for hours here, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's, it's also a question of what comes before the chicken or the egg. There's been like initiatives to try and have public transportation, but because we have such a traffic problem, then the transportation is, is horrible and then people don't use it. And then it's it's just, we have very narrow roads and sometimes the, the transportation um, just doesn't work. Um, um, and there's also like initiatives to try and have an underground system. And, but because it's an island, there's a lot of implications. There's a lot of, um, historical remains in our island which cause all sorts of issues when we try and dig down um, so yeah we're in particular <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you and uh, thank you all for coming thank you